Amen. Hey, good to see everybody out tonight. Amen. I'd like to welcome you to Camp Meeting 2020. How many's enjoyed Camp Meeting so far this week? Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise for what He's done already? Praise the Lord. Hey, real quick, let me show you this new thing I got. I don't know if you can see it back there. Can you see my mask? It's got Mount Bell's logo on it. Uh, pit team are wearing them. And uh, if you'd like one, uh, see Karen Arms back there at the Welcome Center desk. And her, Audrey was a $5. $5 a piece. Uh, it's got our logo. Hey, some of you ladies, you, hey, fit team, walk around let them see your mask. Y'all look at them. You can pick which color you want. There's black or there's white. They got the green and all that. So if you'd like one of these, see them out before you leave. Uh, that'll be a good thing. Uh, hey, if we got to wear a mask, we might as well wear one for Jesus. Amen. <laughs> might have wear one that's got our church logo on it. So I didn't know you stepped up behind me. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. But hey, it's good to see you tonight. Welcome you uh, to camp meeting. Uh, power of Pentecost tonight. Hey, let's do this, Mount Vale. Let's make our guests and visitors welcome. We're so glad you're with us tonight. So glad you're part of the service. And those that are watching Facebook and live streaming, glad you're tuning in with us. How many was here last night? Woo! How many know that the Lord showed up? How many know that one got filled with the Holy Ghost? Woo! Come on now. Hallelujah. Y'all a little weak tonight. Let's do this again. How many know that one got filled with the Holy Ghost and fire? Come on. We are Pentecostal, by the way. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost was the evidence of speaking in tongues. Amen. I like what our general overseer said on Sunday morning. He said, it's time for us to quit hiding it. Come on. It's time for us to quit putting it in the closet in a way. He said, it's time that people hear it, know it, and see it. Amen. Hey, let me tell you what. You know what's going to change this world? is a move of the power of the living God. That's what's going to change this world. Amen. So with all that being said, if you'll stand real quick, don't forget if you're a visitor, just to kind of give you a little FYI, when we take up the offering, we're doing it a little different due to the COVID situation. There'll be uh, two plates up here, and if you want to, you can make your way up and give. And if you're in the back, there'll be two people back in the back who will be having plates back there you can give there. And if you don't feel comfortable getting up and moving around, just raise your hand. They'll come serve you. And also, you'll see it during the offering time, but there's you can give in person. You can give on the kiosk. You can text to give. You don't even have to get out of your seat. There's a church center app and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And there's also one of them little squiggly things. QR on your little brochure. If you picked up a brochure, you can hit that on your phone somehow. And uh, I don't know how, <laughs> but I know you can. And, and it takes you right to it. So remember that tonight. And if you will, make Pastor Kurt Baker welcome as he comes to open with Scripture and prayer tonight. Hey, y'all give me the key of F. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, thanks. Unto me, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Let me not be ashamed. Not my enemies triumph over me. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's good. Hey, they dared me not to do it, so uh, so I had to do it. <laughs> Y'all heard people say I had a request. I had a request, but I'm gonna sing anyway. Y'all ever heard that? Amen. So good to be with y'all in church tonight. We want to welcome you. Like the old preachers, I'll say it again from last night. Like the old preacher said, he said, welcome to a wonderful, awesome, 
Old fashioned Holy Ghost, heaven sent, devil chasing, sin killing, true blue, red hot, blood bought, God given, Jesus loving, indoor camp beating, revival campaign, crusade. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, if, if you're not right, this would be a good night for you to get right. You know that, right? Amen. Y'all have heard the, the preacher tell the story about the uh, getting right. He said there was this young couple that were going to get married, and their friends couldn't attend the wedding, so they sent them an, a note and to, to, to congratulate them on the wedding. And, uh, and at the end of it, they put John 4.18. Well, they meant to put 1 John 4.18. But they put John 4.18. Now, 1 John 4.18 is the verse that says, Perfect love casteth out fear. And that's the verse they were looking for. But that's not the verse they put. They put the verse. Now, here's, here's the bride opening this up. And she looks up the verse, John 4.18. It says, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sense thou truly. Amen. Now, now the guy that, that preached a sermon from that story, he preached a sermon called Almost Right is not right. Y'all hear me? Almost right is not right. Amen. Hey, but it's such a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to open with scripture, but I couldn't help but think, if you'll indulge me just a little more, uh, with the, rain, the rainy weather outside, the preacher that had a, a family of his church hadn't been in weeks, and he went to go see them. And they were sitting on the front porch. And as he walked up to the porch, uh, here, the, here the whole family is just sitting on the front porch, and He's trying to think of a way to tell them that he's been missing them in church. And he just comes out and says, we've been missing you at church lately. And they said, well, preacher, you know it's been raining a lot. He said, yeah, but it's always dry in the church. And they said, well, that's another reason we hadn't been lately, preacher. Y'all hear me? <laughs> that's another reason we hadn't been lately. Amen. So it doesn't have to. We can have showers of blessings in here, right? Amen. Now, as my scripture open, I'll, I'll use Psalm 150, passage you all know. Praise ye the Lord. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psalter and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him upon the stringed instruments. It goes on to say, praise him upon the, the, the organ, it says. He says, upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. And then verse, the, probably the fam most famous verse of the Old Testament, the last verse of Psalm 150. says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise tonight. morning we shall see Jesus in the air coming after you and me joys ours to share well rejoicing there will be with us and shall rise beautiful and jubilee under in the skies oh what singing oh what shouting on the happy morning we'll be
Somebody give the Lord a praise tonight. Oh, come on now. We can do better than that. Somebody that's on their way to heaven. Somebody whose name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Somebody who's made their hope and future with Jesus Christ. Give him your best praise. You've given him all week long. I know you praised good last night, but you can still praise him even better today. Amen. Woo. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As our usher gets ready, let's make welcome. Pastor Larry Frazier is going to come receive our tithes and offering today. Let's make him welcome as he comes. Well, thank God. I can't think of any place I'd rather be than in the house of God. Amen. Now, I can't talk as fast as my brother over here, so I'm not even going to attempt it. But there's one thing I will tell you this evening. You're at a good place. I said you're at a good place. And this is one of the exciting times of a service. Well, some people think so. When we give unto the Lord, we are giving in Tonight, when you give into this offering to this church, every time a soul is touched because there was money to pay the light bill, because there was money to cause ministry to happen, every time your pastor goes to someone's home, and comforts them or preaches a funeral or a wedding whatever the case is is because somebody gave tonight when you give when a soul is saved here in this house you're a part of it amen everything that goes on when you give you're a part of it you can be proud you can be glad about that I don't know about you, but I love to be a part of something great. Amens are like pulling teeth tonight. I said, I love to be a part of something great. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. But he that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. We got a God that's able. Amen. He knows how to take care of us. Tonight, as you give, I want to see some smiles on some faces. Not frowns. If you laugh out loud, it'll be all right. But when you give, give us a heart of love. And I'll guarantee you'll set yourself up for a blessing. Amen. Let us pray. Father, you're such a good God. And you have blessed us in more ways than we can ever return to you. We are thankful tonight for this opportunity. And Lord, we give from our hearts. We know that you're going to bless it. We know that it's going to be used for your glory and for everyone that participates tonight. We pray your special blessings upon them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless.
should I say I don't even know how many nights we've been in church I feel like it's been a lot but so uh, but how many of you have been here one service two services how many of you've been here all of the services and we've seen God do some mighty things amen how many of you know that tonight is no different right so we don't want to we don't want to give God just a little bit tonight of our praise amen we want to give them everything we got. I know some of you may be tired. It's Tuesday. Are we Tuesday night? Yeah, I don't even know. Like I said, we've been here a lot. But but tonight's no different. Amen? So we're going to give them our all right now. We're going to lift up the name of Jesus tonight, this Tuesday night of camp meeting. Amen? We're going to lift up the name of Jesus tonight. How many of you are going to lift up the name of Jesus? Because his name is to be praised. His name is to be magnified. His name is to be worshipped. His name is to be adored. Amen. Because he is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. He is the great I am. He is Prince of Peace. Amen. Oh, come on. Let's do it again. We lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up.
tonight. Hallelujah. Because there is none like him. Amen. Amen. There's none like him. Woo. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's just worship him. Come on, all across this place, just worship him. Oh, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hey. Oh. Down to the crimson river, left my burdens on the shore. Came up a saint, died with Christ. Now I'm reborn. Yes, he washed me in his mercy.
the blood of the Lamb. Oh, we've been redeemed. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, sing it now. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony and the word of our testimony. Come on, sing it now. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. testimony. Come on, with every hand lifted high. Come on, let's sing it now. We overcome. Somebody's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. Hey, look at three people. We ain't supposed to be touching nobody, but look at three people and say, I'm one of them. Three people. One, two, three. I'm one of them. One of them blood ball, fire baptized. Amen. How many just washed in the blood of the Lamb? Aren't you glad tonight to know that you know that you know that you know that you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? You can be seated just for a moment if you'd like. Let me make some acknowledgments before I get myself in trouble here. Amen. How many enjoyed our brother Kirk Baker over here singing that pretty song he sings? Amen. We love brother Kirk. Brother Larry Frazier from White Pine Church of God. Amen. Being with us tonight. And I'll tell you what. Uh, I've got a couple of pastors here that if, uh, if I knew for sure the Lord was coming, I'd want to be standing right between these two guys right here. One of them would be Brother Sam Youngblood right here, and Brother Larry Dye right back there. And also, we got with us tonight, hadn't been with us in a long time, Brother Rick Bradbury. Let's give all these men of God a great hand. Amen. They are laborers in this thing for years and years. Brother Dye is a former pastor here. And I, I, can I tell a story on Brother Dye before we bring the preacher up? Uh, we were cutting out for this building here, and they, they told this on you, Brother Di. I just, I just believe what they say. If it's on the Internet, it has to be true. And, uh, but they said that, uh, that somebody gave these people behind us permission to run their water line across this uh, property here. And uh, the guy on the bulldozer, when he was cutting out for this building, he hit water. I said, sir, I said, they drill for hundreds of feet. And can't hit water. And I said, you hit it with a greater blade. Amen. I just want you to know you got the blame for that, sir. <laughs> Let's give all of our pictures a good hand. We sure do appreciate them. Hey, I am so glad to see all the Mount Vale people. Amen. Let's, let's give all of our guests and visitors a good warm welcome. Can we? You may welcome tonight. This is uh, Brother Small's first time being here. I hope it's not his last time. If you'll smile at him and say amen real nice i think he might come back amen and uh, you don't know what a treat you're in for tonight and i'll let him explain to you about hey, i'm sure you're gonna talk about project pray and some things
What a time we are in. It's the most unusual time of my life, and I'm 150 years old. Never through anything like this. And when I found out most of the meetings that I've been scheduled in have been canceled from South Korea to Africa. In fact, in Benin, the president of the nation had called for a national prayer assembly. And I was supposed to be there. That was, that was, that was canceled. National conference in India, uh, everything. And when I heard that you were bravely by faith going ahead with this meeting. Uh, and of course, the people that you've had, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. You couldn't get any better preachers than you've had, Tim Hill and Tommy Bates. What in the world is going on here? <clears throat> so when I heard, I thought, I felt relieved at one level because I thought, now those guys, they carry the mail way up there. So it'd be okay to have a low evening with somebody like me. <clears throat> But I also knew immediately what I needed to talk to you about tonight. I wanted to share with you from a book. We loaded up a box of books and they put it in the wrong vehicle. And so I don't have them. Two years ago, I was invited to be, along with Dr. Hill, uh, at Wittenberg, Germany for the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's nailing the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. It was my privilege to lead prayer services there two mornings. Barbara and I left Wittenberg, and we went to Herrenhut. How many of you have ever heard of Herrenhut or Hernhut, Germany? Anybody, just raise your hand. There, Rick. Let me tell you about it. When men... And women who are Christians from Eastern Europe began to flee in persecution. They ended up on the estate of Count Zinzendorf. There was dissension. And in May of a certain year, he called the men together and they began to do Bible study and prayer. And then they had a 10-day meeting in which God came in a powerful way. Out of that meeting, they started 24-7 prayer for 110 years in Herrenhut, in this little village in eastern Germany. There was never a time when somebody was not praying. They partnered in prayer for an hour at a time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 110 years. It's called the Moravian Prayer Revival. Out of that came the first 300 missionaries. Out of that came, this is before David Livingston, before Carey, before uh, Judson, before all of the other great missionaries of the 1800s. They tried to sell themselves into slavery to become missionaries, to get passage on a boat to go here or there or preach the gospel. Barbara and I, I'd never been there, so we drove over to Heron Hut. We sat in the chapel. It's a little bigger than this. Hundreds of years old. We walked the streets. We went to the cemetery where, where uh, uh, Christian David was buried and Zinzendorf and others were buried. We went to a couple museums. And then we found a place, a working bed and breakfast, actually a farm just outside the city. Early that morning, the day after the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, God woke me up and rolled me out of bed. I rumbled downstairs in the strange place I was in and found a light switch, opened my Bible and sat down with a writing pad. And the Holy Spirit said, as clearly as I have ever heard a word from God in my life. 
like thunder. I am about to thrust the church into a new apostolic epic. It will not be optional. I insist that my church be a house of prayer for the nations. I grabbed a pad, that pad, and I began to write. And for three hours, I just sat there. And out of that came a book that I released last year called The, the New Apostolic Epic. When COVID-19 came and churches shut down everywhere and businesses shut down everywhere and we found ourselves in the strangest times we've ever found ourselves in, when the rioting began, when the rumbles about the economy began, when the socialists rose up and began to make noises about, about, about really revolution, when 62 congressmen signed a new mandate, in essence, to rewrite the Constitution, I began to realize what God had said to me. He was serious about. He put the pause button on everything. Do you know there were 25 stadium events that were planned for this year? We have never had a time when 25 stadiums were booked for Christian events. Every one of them got canceled because God has decided he's going to do something and he's going to do something his way. Let me take you on a little journey in history. In 100 A.D., 70 years after the crucifixion and resurrection, 30 years after the fall of Jerusalem, there were 20, maybe 25,000 believers. That's all. That's all there were. 20, maybe 25,000. For every one of them, another had been martyred. All the apostles were dead, including John. All had been martyred except John. Paul was gone. Timothy was gone. Titus was gone. John Mark was gone. Luke was gone. The, the brothers of Jesus, James and Jude, were gone. And what you were left with was twenty to 25,000 people holding on to their faith after the persecutions of Nero and Domitian. Fast forward 50 years and the number is 40,000. The church has doubled in 50 years. Fast forward to 180 AD and you will find 100,000 believers on the face of the earth. A five-fold increase. You'll find Christians in 23 of the 31 provinces. Fast forward to 197, and you have a movement of Christianity in every nation on the face of the earth. Moved to the year 250 A.D., and the number of Christians has now passed 1 million. In 70 years, they moved from 100,000 to 1 million, a 10 fold increase. Go to the year 310. That's just 60 years further. And now you have 20 million Christians in the empire, in the, in the, on the globe, and you have 10 million in the empire. That's a 20-fold increase in just 60, in just 60 years. That comes despite 10 imperial persecutions. That comes after the death of bishop after bishop. That comes after the, after the wasting of the smartest minds, the best minds they have. That comes in a sea of paganism where Christianity is completely illegal and worship has to take place in secret. They grew. The, 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 the nation of Rome, the kingdom of Rome, was no match for this group of roaring lions. No buildings, no budget, no favor, few resources, and they grew, they exploded. How did it happen, and can it happen again? Here's how it happened. 
ordinary Christians fellowship with the fire and shared what was happening out in, in their lives in daily encounters with God until it affected one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16. And the movement became unstoppable. But it grew not on the back of preachers. It grew on the back of people like you. This was a group that was not prayed for. This was a group that prayed. This is a group that was not sang to. This is a group of singing Christians whose fire and song could not be put out. This is what God is calling us to today. I think things will never go back to normal. I think things will never go back to the way they were. It isn't God's plan for them to go back to the way they were. God is calling you to know him in a way you have never known him before. God is calling you to meet him every day over an open Bible until it leaps off the pages and comes alive and burns in your heart. God is calling you to walk in the Spirit like you've never walked in the Spirit before. God is calling you to learn how to pray for your neighbors when they're sick and share the gospel with them. God is calling you to a place you've never been. And that may be frightening to some of us, but this is exactly where God wants us to be. When Jesus comes into the temple, the early part of his life, and his ministry, he goes, he goes into the court of the Gentiles. It's interesting because, you see, the Jewish leaders had commandeered the court of the Gentiles and they had set up tables to exchange currency. You brought your money and they said to you, well, that's the, you can't give that money. Not, not, no, you need, you need temple currency. Go over there and, and, and you can exchange. Or, and you get over there and the exchange rate is 30%. You say, you're kidding me. No, no, no. You, you have to pay your temple tax. And so you're going to have to change your money. You brought your lamb to be sacrificed, but it has to be examined. And inevitably, it didn't pass inspection. And so, and so they say, well, we, we know that you don't want to lead a lamb around. So we'll, they'll, they'll buy it from you right over there. And, and, they, and then you go over there and you say, you, that, that's all you can give me? Yeah, that's all we can give you. You can lead the rat lamb around the city, but we'll, we'll be glad to buy it for that price. All right, I need to trade some money, and then I've got to come back and get an acceptable animal. Then you come back and get the acceptable animal. Guess which one they want to sell you? They want to sell you the one that you just sold them for two to three times the price. So Jesus comes into that part of the temple, the court of the Gentiles, and he goes wild. You see, what's happened is the Jews have taken the evangelistic center of the temple that wrapped around the temple, the court of the Gentiles, not the court of the women, not the court of the men, not the court of the priests, but the one place where the nations could come. And, and they have repurposed it for financial reasons that ingratiate themselves. And Jesus goes wild. And he throws the tables over and releases the animals and, and the doves. And his disciples are standing back saying, what in the world has gotten into him? And he does it twice. He does it at the beginning of his ministry and he does it at the end of his ministry. Let me say this to you. And I'm, I'm, this is a hard word. The entire ministry of Jesus was a protest against the establishment of the temple as it was. And see, here's our problem. We say, well, that could never happen to us. We could never be so blind that we would not recognize God moving. We, we, I mean, if, if he came to our church, he wouldn't throw the temple, he wouldn't throw the tables over. I mean, he would like it, he would dance, he would shout, he would join our praise team. You see, that's the problem, is that we get so locked in on our kind of church and the way we like church, and the songs we like, and the fried chicken we like, and the banana pudding we like, and church as culture more than Christ, that we become blind, that we're squeezing out people who don't know the gospel, people who have never heard the gospel. Around me in my city in Charlotte, 30 unreached people groups live, 30. 
These are Muslims. These are Sheikhs. These are Hindus. These are Buddhists. And they've never heard the gospel. The Lord is bringing the nations to us and parking them all around us. But we have closed up the court of the Gentiles. That is, we don't have appropriate bridges to reach out to these people who have never heard the gospel, nor to allow them to come into our churches and to experience us. So God is wanting the church to become missional, not just about us. Am I, am I, am I mean enough yet? I'm just reading what the pastor sent me. He said, I don't want to preach this, so why don't you come in and preach, uh, and preach, and pre- and preach the, uh, this. Right now, the church is not a house of prayer. And when we pray, it's about us. It's about prayer request. It's about our pain, our hurt. And what we've got to learn to do, while prayer requests are biblical, we've got to learn to push those back and pray for the thing that matters to God. And that is that 4 billion people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ hear the gospel. And that after 2,000 years, we roll up our sleeves and say, Lord, we need to finish the job you've committed us to do. We need to preach the gospel. Church can't be about us. It has to be about the lost people around us. And we have to find a way to reach our lost people. I want you just to stop and lift your hands to heaven and just pray for some lost person right now. I want you to just call their name. I don't know who they are, but I just want you to pray for them right now. God, I just pray. I pray for my grandson, God. I pray, oh, Lord, that you'd touch him. I pray that you'd save him. I pray that you'd reach down and turn him around, God. I pray for a neighbor of mine, Lord. I pray, God, for people around us that have never heard the gospel and never believed and never understood that you would touch them in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, make me more aware. Make me more aware of what you're calling me to do, what you're calling us to do. I think without realizing it, we've made the church a kind of theater. Would you agree? And, 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 and we, we like this kind of preaching and we like this kind of music and we like this kind, and we've made it a spectator event rather than our coming in and seeing it as the staging event for mission and ministry. And here's what I hear God saying. I'm going to change this. I'm not happy with this being just for you. You've shut up the kingdom for yourself. I want this to be about the nations. I think we've centered since the Reformation on the pulpit and the preaching of the word. And God is calling us back to the altar to fill up the altar, to get the altars full, to make sure people are invited to the altar, to give ourselves in the altar, to surrender ourselves, to submit ourselves to God. I think we've depended upon the pastor, and God is calling us to depend upon the laity to rise up. Pentecost has always been about lay people filled with the Holy Spirit. I think I think this has been about somebody doing something to us, praying for us, preaching at us, rather than our uh, entering into the presence of God and experiencing something so profound and life-changing that the people around us say, what is happening to you? You glow. What is happening to you? God, the Spirit of God is on you. What is happening to you? You've been changed yourself. You've been, you've been transformed. I think we've made this about come to rather than go ye. I think we've made this about a place rather than the person of Jesus Christ himself. I think we've made this about a ceremony rather than being changed, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't need this, but maybe you do, and I'm willing to sit through it for you. What we need is a Pentecostal church. I don't mean a hallelujah church. I don't mean a church that raises your hands and people dance. Those are superficial things. I mean deep, profound dependence upon the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit is grieved. I think he wants the church back. And sometimes... We pastors, we talk, we call it, we call it our church and our people. It's his church. It belongs to him. I think the Holy Spirit 
wants the church back. And he wants this church to be Pentecostal. In fact, I think he wants it to be profoundly Pentecostal. You know, when I grew up, and I'm, I'm an old person now, I, I can still remember the egg stains on the church. I can still remember people driving by and the cat calls. I can remember the teachers in the room whispering and pointing me out because I was the only Pentecostal in the room. And he, 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 he's going to be, he's, he's different. Yo, what, watch out for him. I can remember when the dances took place. I'm over in the side. I can remember when the movies were shown. I sat outside. I, I don't regret that at all. I really don't. I'm not bitter about that at all. In, in fact, let me just say this to you. I think sometimes when I was growing up in the church, the symbols of differentiation, do you know what I mean by that? The symbols of differentiation that we had, symbols of differentiation for the world. You can't do that, you can't go there, you can't do this, you can't, you, you, know, those, you know those things that we used to believe in? I, I, I think those symbols may have been misplaced, but here's what I think was profound about them. We had the moral courage to be different from the world. And now we've lost the moral courage to be different from the world. We, we went through a season where Pentecost was a cult. Our pastors couldn't be a part of a ministerial association. We were set aside. We were rejected. We were, we, were, we were the holy roller church in the town. And then we came into a season in the last 70 years where Pentecost is mainstream. Pentecost is acceptable. Pentecostal churches are the biggest churches in town. But here's the problem. We cannot be, we must not be evangelicals with tongues. Luther introduced to the church justification by faith. Wesley introduced sanctification. In Luther, we're confronted with the truth about sin and where we are with God and our need to be acquitted of our sins. In Wesley, our heart is strangely warmed and we experience not the truth of God, but we experience the love of God rolling over us like thunderous waves. But in Pentecost, but in Pentecost, you taste the power of God. You taste the power of God. It is a people who have tasted the power of the age to come, the power of the world to come. It's people who know what it means to traffic in spiritual transactions. It's people who hear the voice of God and move with God and act with God by faith. You see, Pentecostalism is a completely different brand of Christianity than all the other churches in town because it has to do with the power and presence and permeating life of the Spirit that wakes us up in the middle of the night and calls us to do this. Pentecost involves not left-brain rationalism where you figure everything else out. It involves the mystery of God where you're called to do this and you don't even realize what you're doing or you don't even understand it, but you begin to operate in a completely different dimension by faith. Are you breathing? Our missionary... Ed Call in Japan was away. His wife had gone through some serious health issues. One of the Japanese sisters had come to the hospital and just laid herself across the body of Sister Call in the hospital and entered into an intercessory lament for her. And God restored her and she left the hospital and, and went back home. And then her husband, Ed, a missionary, they're both with the Lord now. They told me this story. She said the Church of God compound there was right next to a Buddhist temple. And she said you could feel the oppression, the spiritual oppression from that Buddhist temple. She said one morning it was just overwhelming. Absolutely overwhelming. And she said, I called a missionary friend, not a Pentecostal. 
And I said, is there any way you can come and pick me up? She said, we didn't even have a phone. She said, I, I, I walked in, 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 a, in, in dusty snow, a dusty bit of snow, to a pay phone and called this missionary. And she said, I'll be right there. And I went back and got dressed. And she picked me up and took me to her house. She said, she set me down a little table with a warming element and put some tea on and began to comfort me. And her phone rang. And she went to the phone and picked up the phone. And she says, yes, that's right, yes. Yes, there is a, a, a yes, there is a, a missionary here. Yes. Yes, and, and I too am a, yes, I, yes, I am. And you want me to do, and you want me to say, can I do that? I, I think I can, I think I can do that. And when she hung up the phone, she says, why does a sheep? And Sister Call said, that was Paul Yongi Cho. You know who Paul Yongi Cho is, pastor of the, Largest church in the world, 750, 800,000 people, a Pentecostal church in South Korea. He had called her and said, you have a missionary with you, yes. She's had some health issues, yes. She's right now experiencing spiritual oppression from the e evil one, from the enemy. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I mean by that? I, th I think I understand. This is not a Pentecostal. I want you to go over and lay hands on her now. Can, can you do that? Will you do that? Well, I think I can. I, sure I can. I want you to pray this prayer over here, and I want you to make this declaration over her. Can you, can you do that? And this missionary looked at Sister Call and said, this is what he asked me to do. And they prayed together. Almost a year later, the calls are in Orlando at First Assembly of God, and, and Paul Yonggi Cho is there. And Sister Call goes up on the platform and finds him and says, Do you remember making a call? He said, Yes. In fact, he said, he said she learned later he was walking through the airport in Honolulu. And God stopped him and gave him a number to call. And he went to the phone and dialed that number and the Holy Spirit told him what to say. And he looked at Sister Call and he said, are you now free? She said, I, 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 I hope I am. He said, he laid hands on her and he said, be free. I am talking about being profoundly Pentecostal. I'm talking about moving in the spirit. I'm talking about participating in the mysteries of God. I'm talking about walking in faith. I'm talking about not worrying about whether I'm foolish or I look smart or I look this way or I look that way. I'm talking about being a sold out agent of God where he yields, where he touches me. And the more I yield to him, the more the power of the Holy Spirit flows through me. Think about it. Paul is gone. Timothy is gone. Titus is gone. James is gone. Jude's gone. Who's left? You. You are left. And you, the lay people, have to pick up the mantle. You have to pick up the word. You have to pray for the sick. You, see this is where I think God is trying to get us. I think he's trying to bring us back to an apostolic era where we are moving and flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the whole church is alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me take you on a journey. There are three periods in the Old Testament where miracles cluster. They bunch. They're not evenly distributed. The first period is in the time of Exodus, the time of Moses. When the plagues come, and every plague, you remember, was an attack upon an Egyptian deity to show it to be powerless. The second collection of miracles and season of miracles is in the time of Elijah and Elisha. What's happening? The nation is backsliding and adopting Baalism. The third Season of miracles is in the time of Daniel and the three Hebrew children. What's happened? Israel is gone, never to be recovered. Judah is in Babylon. 
And so now God is going to raise the nation from the dead. Watch this. Watch this. In the first wave of miracles, God redeems a people. You have Passover. You have the blood. You have the calling out. In the second wave of miracles, God is attempting to revive a people and call them away from paganism. In the third wave of miracles, he's raising the nation from the dead. Now, what is redemption and revival and resurrection? Who does that point to? It points to the greatest wave of miracles ever during the time of Jesus and the book of Acts and the apostolic church. Let me say it to you again. Let me show it to you again. When paganism rises up, When it threatens the purposes of God, when it threatens the people of God, when it seems to take over, God acts in behalf of his own purposes to re-secure his people, to redeem his people, to revive his people, and if necessary, to raise churches from the dead. God is responsible for his purposes. Now, if that's true, let me tell you, with the rise of paganism, the rise of atheism, the rise of an antichrist spirit, even in our own nation, with the declarations, you can't pray, you can't have church. If you do have church, you can't sing. If you preach, pastor, we're going to arrest you. COVID aside, COVID aside, we have never seen this kind of open hostility against the Christian faith, this being the case. This is the time when God acts. This is the time when God moves. This is the time when God shows up. This is the time when God says, this is not a philosophy. I am real. This is a living faith. And I think we can expect in our time, I think we can hope for, I think we can pray for a move of God like we have never seen before. Not for us. Not for us to stand back and say, oh, isn't that wonderful, that healing, that, mil- that, that wheelchair that got emptied. But so that a skeptical world that doesn't believe will come, will come to believe. Right now, right now, the world in which we believe sees us as a widow. They believe that Christ is dead. Christianity is like Buddhism. It's like Hinduism. It's like Islam. It's just one more way to... But Buddha's dead. Mohammed is dead. What makes this different is that this is a a living faith with a living Lord who went to the Father and said they can't make it by themselves. Send the... Send the Holy Ghost who is the other Jesus. He is the one who doesn't have a body but he works through my body and your body. And the whole purpose of the Holy Ghost, the ghost of Jesus. He's in the room, you know. The ghost of Jesus is in the room. Have you seen him anywhere tonight? Do, 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 do. He's in the room. And wherever you go, you don't travel alone. You travel with the the ghost of Jesus. Do you go with the ghost of Jesus? You should go with the ghost of Jesus. And the problem with the ghost is you can't control him. You never know what he's going to do, the ghost of Jesus. He touches through my touching and loves through my loving and cares through my caring and speaks through my speaking until the invisible God begins to be revealed in me. And people see me and say, you couldn't have done that. What is that? It's the ghost. It's the ghost of Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit living in me as the proof that Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. Oh my goodness, it's six o'clock. We need to be Pentecostal. We need to be profoundly Pentecostal. We need to be perceptibly Pentecostal. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go much longer. 
this morning I was with a group of pastors in North Carolina. Loran Livingston was there who is our speaker on Forward and Faith at our international broadcast and a dear friend, pastor at the Central Church. And we were talking about the churches that the two of us grew up in. Here's how the old Pentecostals used to pray. They used to lay their Bibles Sunday evening, what were Sunday school classes in the morning became prayer rooms in Sunday, on the Sunday evening. They'd lay their Bibles on cane bottom chairs. Cane bottom chair is about the cheapest chair you can get. It, there was no carpet on the floor. There was no tile on the floor. That's just bare concrete. I, I would probably get into trouble, so my mother parked me with my grandfather, and I went into the prayer room with him. And those old preachers would lay, or those laymen, my granddad's generation, and the preachers did it too. They would lay their Bibles on those cane bottom chairs and they would read to themselves out loud. And then they'd get up and walk about the room and pray and cry. And then they'd come back and, and they'd kneel down where that Bible was open on that chair. And they'd read a little more until they couldn't kneel anymore. And then they'd get up and walk about the room. And it wasn't a big room and they'd almost run into one another. And they'd pray in English and pray in tongues and they'd stop and cry and worship. And then they'd come back and get on their knees again and they'd read a little more from the book. They read themselves full of the Word of God. They read themselves full of victory. They read themselves full of joy. You see, much of our praying, it, let, let me ask you this. You believe that I'm a pretty good guy? Do you? You know, I'm, I'm the prayer coordinator for the denomination. Did you know that? I'm a hot shot. Do you trust me? Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to help you out. Give me your number, and I'm going to call you and give you a prayer agenda for you to pray every day. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you that prayer agenda. Now look at me and say, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. You, would, you, would you want me to do that for you? No, you don't want that. You don't want me to control your prayer life. Is that right? So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If, 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 if you have pretty good confidence in me, do you have confidence in me? I couldn't get them to, I, I'm not convinced that they do, but do you have confidence in me? Even if you have confidence in me, you don't trust me to control your prayer life, do you? You don't want to do that. So you probably wouldn't let the devil control your prayer life, would you? No, 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 but I think we do. See, if all of your praying is about the spiritual warfare you think you're under, and if all of your praying is about the, the brokenness of this world and the struggles of living in a broken, fallen world, you have just let the randomness of the world and the devil set your prayer agenda. And so your prayer life tends to be a reaction against everything that's happening around you and something else is setting your prayer agenda. What the old Pentecostals that turned cities upside down learned was that the Word of God had to be their prayer agenda. They prayed the Word of God, and they prayed it until they were full of the Word of God. And then they lived out of that. And when they met people in need, they said, I just read this morning, can I just pray for you right here? And God used ordinary people full of the Word and full of the Spirit. And they turned little cities upside down, and it's still happening around. It's still happening around the world. i got to stop. To be perceptibly Pentecostal means that we allow the Holy Spirit to affect our perception of the Word of God until the Scripture comes and listen to me. Please listen to me. You will never grow on preaching. You will not grow by listening to praise music. It will help you some. You will grow as much as you grow your prayer life. And your prayer life will be as deep and rich 
as its connections to the Word of God. And when you learn to pray the Scripture, when you learn to get on your knees and read a verse and pray it and read another verse and pray it until the Bible becomes your prayer book, here's why. The clearest way you see God is through this book. And the clearest way you see yourself, this is like a window, a looking glass that lets you see God and it's like a mirror. And you begin to see yourself and you see God and you see God and you see yourself. And the Holy Spirit over an open Bible begins to change you in ways that you don't even realize you're being changed. And how is he, how is he changing you? He's making you like the Father. So, so we have to be perceptibly Pentecostals. That is, the Holy Spirit heightens spiritual perception and understanding until we have these aha moments where we realize God is speaking to us and changing us and transforming us. i got to stop. You know, we've been accused of being uh, non-intellectual. But, but Pentecostalism isn't, it isn't non-intellectual, it isn't anti-intellectual, but it is anti-intellectualism or intellectualistic, meaning this. Here's our thesis. We have always believed that ordinary people like you and me, I was raised on a cotton mill with humble people. We've always believed that ordinary fishermen and tax collectors who prayed and exposed themselves to the word of God, that God would use them and raise them up and they could change whole cities. We've insisted that it doesn't take a doctorate We've insisted that you don't have to have a 12-cylinder brain. We've insisted that God uses ordinary people like me and you. And if we will give ourselves to God, he will begin to download mysteries that you have no way of understanding. And he will begin to use you in ways that are more profound than you could ever, ever imagine. Here's what I believe. I believe we're on the early side of a profound change in the church. And what we've known in the past, church is a place where we go to and have 30, 40 minutes of praise music and an offering and, and, and a sermon. And then we try to beat the Baptist to the buffet. That is gone. 80% of churches will come back after COVID and try to get things back like they were. But a small number of churches will venture out and say, God, you are up to something different. And we want to follow hard after you. We are in an era when the Holy Spirit is calling for a new reformation of the church. Number two, he's not asking us to add prayer to what we are doing. He wants the church to be not a house of preaching, but a house of prayer. And not a house of prayer for us, but a house of prayer for the nations. Number three. There will come a point, just as 40 years after the death of Christ, Jerusalem collapsed, there will come a point at the whole system that we now have called church, I'm saying some radical things to you, will collapse. Our Jerusalem will fall. Our temple system will fall. At some point, we will be forced underground. And the culture of entertainment, of worship as entertainment, will go. And God is calling some churches on the early side of this to rise up and be the first pacing churches in this process of change and transformation. I'm talking to you like a prophet tonight. When this happens, the member, pass, member passive, pastor active dichotomy will break and fall away. When this happens, the church diaspora scattered Monday through Friday 
will become as important as the church ecclesia gathered, no matter where we gather or for how long we gather. For a short season, there will be a debris field because we won't know what's going on, just as there is now. There's a debris field. There's a lot of pastors who are depressed, a lot of pastors who are discouraged, a lot of members who are confused, a lot of people, I just don't know what's going on. I can't figure out what's, what's, what's going on. We can expect a debris field, and then the vision of what God is doing will, 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 will clear up. And one of the things that will become clear to us is that he's not wanting us to be church-centered. He's wanting us to be Christ-centered. He's wanting us to stop living from Sunday to Sunday. And begin to live day to day out of a relationship with him. Number five. And I only have 50 of these. He's not asking us to change the flavor of the church. He's asking us to change the DNA of the church. Back to mission. To finish what he's called us to do. From the pulpit to the altar. Deep dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit and a recovery of what Luther talked about in the first Reformation, the priesthood, the priesthood of all believers. Every member filled with the Spirit. Every member fellowshipping with the fire. I know you're up here to play stopping music, but just hang on for just a minute, okay? I'm just trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit here tonight. Listen to me now. I was in the room when somebody talked about We Pentecostals believe in speaking in tongues. How many of you here speak in tongues? Here's the deal. Speaking in tongues is not about speaking in tongues. Paul said we speak what? Mysteries. This is what I mean by being profoundly Pentecostal. There are nine ways the Holy Spirit manifests himself. Discerning of spirits, that means you recognize that is the Holy Spirit. It's not a demon. It's not a human spirit. You even recognize the mood of the spirit. It's quickening inside. That's 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 the ghost. Do 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 do. Ghost. Pays to travel with a ghost, especially the Holy Ghost. You see, if you if you can discern. That it's the Holy Spirit. Then you can. Then you can receive a word of wisdom. And a word of knowledge. Because you've just figured out. That's the. That's the Lord talking to me. And he gives you knowledge. That you did not have any way of knowing. And he gives you wisdom. Where things just fall together. That quickens faith. And here's what faith does. Faith unlocks the gift of healing and miracles. So you've got two key gifts, and now you've unlocked six gifts. I discern, that's God. Faith, that opens miracles and healing. Tongues, what's that all about? We see if you can discern that it's God and you can hear God and you can by 
faith speak forth in a language you have never learned and you don't even know what the language is, which means you're speaking what? Mysteries. If you can do that, you've just unlocked the prophetic and you've just unlocked uh, interpretation of tongues. But you see, that's really not the point. The point is that you've reached now a threshold where you're about to walk into a realm of the Spirit where God comes alive to you, where you see things that ordinary people don't see and hear things that ordinary people don't hear and God is talking to you and whispering to you and the ghost is with you all the time and you pray for this person and there's a miracle or healing or something else that takes place. And you see, you see, you see, you see, if you can recognize that it's God and speak what he, what he gives you by faith, and you don't even know what that is, tongues, then the question is tomorrow, when he says, see that guy in that pickup truck over there? I want you to go over and tell him that that his mother that's been dead 10 years is now around the throne in heaven, and it's time for the prayers that she prayed for him to be answered because there's a call on his life. You look at that guy and you say, he doesn't even look like he had a mother. You look at that guy and say, that guy, he could beat me. That, that guy, you see, it, it might as well be tongues to you. It might as well be tongues to you. What, what God is, listen, what God has done is giving you a laboratory lesson. What God has done is giving you a laboratory lesson in what it means to be a spirit filled believer. It's not about waving your hands. It's not about getting crazy. It's not about dancing in the aisles. This is about being an agent of God for mission in a world that's full of darkness and demonic power. And something is in you that is bigger and greater than any of those things. You see what what, what happens to Pentecostals is that is it is that we get up to the door and stammer in tongues and we say, Pastor, I got it. Hallelujah, glory to God. Now I can go sit back down and I don't ever have to go through that again. When what God is wanting is for us not just to get to the threshold of Pentecost, but to begin to live in the dimension of what it means to walk in the Spirit and fellowship with the ghost. I'm telling you that God is trying to reform His church in order to make us ready to be the apostolic last days church and bring in the harvest that he wants. I got to stop. Let me ask you a question, Pastor. What's the, po- what's the county we're, we're in here? What is the population of Jefferson County? 60,000. Isaiah 6 says, a tenth shall return. Here's what I want to challenge you to pray for. I want you to pray for God's tent in Jefferson County. I want you to pray for a revival so profound that 6,000 people in the space of two to three years get saved. I want you to pray for the meanest people in this county to come to know Jesus Christ. I want you to pray for the hardest heart to come to know Jesus Christ. I want you to pray for the most outspoken people against God and Christianity to be gripped by the reality that they can't deal with the ghost. I want you to pray that the ghost will visit their home every night and sit in the rocking chair and make it move by their bed all by himself. I want you to pray that the supernatural hand of God will be around them in inexplicable ways and they will be con- convicted of God until they begin to come into this church and that church and that church until hundreds, no thousands of people in this county until it profoundly changes this county until across the nation people say, have you heard about what's happening in Jefferson City, uh, Tennessee, little town over there? God has come to town. The ghost is in the town. This is the Reformation that I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over the building.
don't believe tonight, church, we've heard from the heart of God. I've been talking before we ever got into the COVID thing. I've been talking about what Pentecost was really about. And essentially, what our evangelist did tonight was, is he took, it, he took your right away from you to make church all about you. Sometimes, but small, I feel like a politician as a pastor. I, I feel like if I miss somebody's hand, they won't come back. That's an overwhelming responsibility. For as a pastor, I feel the responsibility for your soul. But I believe tonight that our evangelist put you in responsibility for your own soul tonight. Amen. I want to let me tell you a little story, and I want us to pray. And I want those that are serious. I want you to. I, I want those that are serious to come. Because what you're saying is, is I want to be a part of what Acts one and eight is talking about. The empowerment that our general bishop told us that it wasn't for our enjoyment; it was for our employment. And I'd been saying that for months. I backed in. Sunday afternoon and this guy pulls up and blocks me in and I, I wasn't born in church and raised in church I, when I got saved the devil called an emergency meeting sat down and cried and said we lost the best one we had and put on a night shift and so I, I immediately my mind goes back to well, I was raised, I thought, man, this guy's come to fight, and I hate to have to whip a guy before I come to church tonight. I don't want to fight nobody. And he got out, and I looked down, and you, you know how we hillbillies, I got a carry permit, and I got my gun in the car, and I thought, I sure don't want to shoot this guy. He walks over to the car, and I rolled out my window, and I said, can I help you? He said, yes, sir. He said, I was driving by your church, he said, I saw this purse laying right in front of the church. And he said, I'm just, I was just sure that one of the good ladies at Mount Vale had lost her purse. Some of y'all seen me. I came in with it last Sunday night. And I said, thank you. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get it to the person that it belongs to. I said, young man, I said, do you go to church anywhere? He hung his head and he said, no, sir. He said, I don't go to church anywhere. He said, I work seven days a week to take care of my family. He said, but when I can, I watch Mount Bell on Facebook. He said, I love your church. And he said, I believe there's good people that goes there. We've been here 101 years this month. 101 years right here in this area. And I've been saying for months on end, even before the COVID, at the end of last year, I've been saying that God wants to do something huge in this area. That He wants us to get into the community. Amen. We've been talking about, and I've borrowed, if you wondered where I borrowed the term from, I got it from that man right there, visual evangelism. I said, they don't want to know. They, they, they don't care how much we know till they know how much we care. And if you want to be the church tonight, if you want to be the church that God is going to use in this life, how, how many can concur with me tonight that we are in the end times? Amen. We are, we, if this is not the end times, I don't want to see it. And how many would just come and say, tonight, church is not going to be about me. Church is not going to be about whether they shook my hand, looked at it, or, or, they, or it's not going to be about how they made me feel. We quit church for people getting in our parking places. We stopped going to church because somebody looked at me funny. We quit coming to church because they sat in our seat. Eternity is forever and ever and ever, and it's so much more important then we're there, we're there, we're there. You can have my seat if you want my seat. I just want you in a right relationship with God that we be the church. I'm going to say one more thing, and then I want you to come. Listen, I, I've said this so many times. 
I, I were not raised with a Pentecostal spoon in my mouth. I hadn't heard whether there'd be a Holy Ghost or not. I was raised in a missionary Baptist church, premillennial missionary Baptist. They didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost as we do. But with what spirit they had, the pastor stood in the 70s. And I remember he, cl he climbed to the highest place in Morristown. And he said, God, give me this city. And he believed God. And they don't even, they don't even I never heard Acts chapter 2 preached in my life till I come to the church of God. But with what spirit they had, they understood the gravity of, of, of lost people around them. And they indicted every one of us. We left. I knew when I left that little Baptist church, I knew that I had a response, I had a moral responsibility to tell every man, woman, boy, and girl of the hope that lied within me. And I say this all the time. It's the hardest thing I ever did in my life is to teach Pentecostal people. You have a moral responsibility tonight to reach out. Do you know when that, when that young man started to leave the car, God quickened my heart and said, talk to him and ask him about me. How many times has God quickened our hearts and we just let it go by? Not anymore. The altars is open. And if you, want, if you want to be a part of what God's doing in these last days, children of God, come. Get out of your seat. If you want to, if you want to practice social distancing, that's okay. You pray all the way across the front. I think, it's a, I think you need to make the action of moving to say, I'm one of them, God. I want to be a part of what you are doing in these last days. I don't, I don't. I don't want the Lord to come back. I, I may not. I may not have the correct. I may not have the correct interpretation. But what, but I told you this already. When I was preaching the other day on the five wise and the five foolish, I may have. I may not have this correct. I can be corrected. But according to what Jesus said, half the church is not even going in the rapture. Half of them don't have the spirit. I don't know about you, but I want the spirit. I want to be used of God. I want you to be used of God. This has to be a place that we come in. This is a house of bread that we come into. This is a spiritual hospital that we bring in people that they get healed up and we go back out and find more sick people and bring in here. Can we pray? You don't have to come to the altar. But can we just pray? I thoroughly enjoyed this message and I fed my soul. It reiterates a lot of things I've been trying to say for months. He just says it better than me. Let's pray, Father. Oh, God, we're so thankful, Lord, for your word. I'm thankful, Lord, when the word of God finds us out. I'm thankful when we are challenged by the power of your spirit and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, tonight, as we gather around these altars and call on you, Lord, it's not about us anymore. It's not, it's not about you. It's not about us coming in this place and feeling good. It's about us coming in and being filled up with your spirit and going out to a lost and a dying generation and imparting unto them. Oh, God, help us that it won't be about us anymore. But God, let it be about who we can reach for you. We are the only agent in the earth that's instituted by you to go and get the lost. May we become these people in, in this community, in this state, God, in this country, in this world that goes, that you give us, that we leave these altars tonight, God, with a passion for what you're passionate about, and that is souls. God, give us a passion for so God, I cry out, Lord, the, the lady that lives across the street from me, she don't even, she thinks you're a myth, God. God, please deal with her heart. God, please show up in her life. God, open a door that we can talk to her that she would not die lost. God, Lord, my son, Lord, tonight I call out my son's name. Lord, he stood here and preached, and he's gone. God, go get Caleb and bring. He's moved out of state. God, you know where he's at, right where he is.
bring him back. We need him in this end time harvest to go forth. God, bring our family in that's lost. May they be filled up and may they go out and get their friends and their family and bring them in, God. God, may we never lose the intensity of this moment. God, tonight, help us leave this place and lead us, God, to those, those that need to know there's hope. Lead us to those. Lord, my, Lord, please set people in our paths and give us the boldness to tell them of the hope that lies within us. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Change us, God. We need to be changed. Remake us, oh Lord. Remake our hearts, God. That we understand it's not about us anymore, but it's about a risen Savior, the hope of glory. God, we give you praise. I'll sing something, children. Whatever's on your heart, we'll sing something. I take an amazing grace on that saxophone, beauty. That'd work for me. Anything y'all want to sing?
Amen. How many was touched by that message tonight? Oh, come on. I know a lot more of you were touched by that message than that. God is such an amazing God. I love when we have these uh, camp meetings. Uh, it opens my eyes to a lot of different things. I love when other uh, men and women of God come in here with an anointing that just 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 makes you yearn for for a, a deeper, closer relationship with God. Amen. How many is excited about tomorrow? You guys are weak. How many is excited about tomorrow? The rest of the week. Amen. This thing's gonna keep going, right? He's not done. He didn't. He didn't do his best work already. He's gonna keep going. Amen. Hey, we need to be telling people about this. There's a lot of empty seats. We need to be telling people about what God's doing. That's what it's all about. He says, go out into all the world and tell people about Jesus Christ. We're not doing our jobs if we're not witnessing and reaching the lost, right? Woo. Come the 30th, I hope most of you people are saved because I'm supposed to be preaching that night. So I hope we get a little louder than that. But let's come expecting God to move. You know, Paul says he staggered not at the promises of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to do. Amen. So you just hang on to the promises of God and believe that, that no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what the world's telling us, what social media is telling us, God's bigger than anything going on. Amen. All right. I can, I can tell you guys are all hungry. I know I'm hungry. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to be doing. Father, we ask that you would just, just allow that to just get into our hearts, deep into the root of our heart. Lord, allow us to go out and to win the lost. Lord, lay burdens on us. Lord, God, as 